Our scripture reading this morning is Genesis chapter 29, verse 31 through chapter 30, verse 24. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So she said, Here is my maid Bilhah. Go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him Bilhah, her maid, as wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as wife. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, A troop comes. So she called his name Gad. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, I am happy, for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. Now Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, Is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, Therefore he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come into me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages, because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterward, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. So God has blessed me in many ways, but one of the ways that I'm most thankful for is that he has blessed me with a wife that loves me. This year in June will be 23 years of marriage, and our love for each other gets stronger every year. However, this doesn't mean that we don't have our moments of conflict. I know that uh, from time to time I make mistakes and do things that upset her. I'm not going to list any of them right now. I don't want to tear off any scabs, open any old wounds. Uh, but I know that I make these mistakes because she is very diligent about letting me know. <clears throat> but one of the ways that I know something is wrong is that she stops talking to me. Now this may not bother some men, but it bothers me. I honestly like the sound of Grace's voice, and I like it when she communicates with me. It's healthy for husbands and and wives that communicate openly and honestly with each other. And I feel loved by Grace when she talks with me and shares with me. So when she stops talking with me, I don't feel that love. 
Intellectually, I know that she still loves me and that she's just upset about something. But in that moment, Satan is telling me lies and trying to tear us apart. Now, Satan wants me and everyone else here to associate love with a feeling so that when we don't feel loved, we'll get angry and depressed and look for what we think is love wherever we can get it instead of turning to God, the true source of perfect love. Now, in today's passage, we see that Jacob does not love Leah. In fact, he hates her. In verse 31, when it says Leah was unloved, the word literally means hated. I can only imagine how Leah must have felt to be married to a man that was not in love with her and never wanted to be with her in the first place. But God sees the situation that she is in and responds by opening her womb. Leah looks at this as an opportunity to earn Jacob's love. In verse 32, she says, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Then she conceives again and bears another son and says in verse 33, Because the Lord has heard me that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And after giving Jacob two sons, apparently he still doesn't love her because she says in verse 34, after giving him a third son, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. And maybe he does finally soften toward her some, because after giving birth to a fourth son, in verse 35 she says, now I will praise the Lord. <clears throat> Another sign that Jacob may have softened some toward Leah is that we see in the first verse of chapter 30 that Rachel is jealous of Leah because of her ability to bear children. So Rachel turns the blessing of childbirth into a competition. She gives her maid to Jacob, and he has two sons with Bilhah. So this causes Leah to give her maid to Jacob, and then uh, Zilpah has two sons. By this point, whatever softening Jacob had toward Leah seems to be gone because by verse 16 of chapter 30, Leah has to hire him to spend the night with her. She says, you must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. So Leah has two more sons and a daughter before Rachel finally has a son of her own, Joseph. And then later, Rachel dies giving birth to Jacob's final son, Benjamin. But if childbirth was meant to be a way for women to earn their husband's love, then Leah would be the clear winner in this competition. She gave birth to six sons and a daughter, while Bilhah, Zilpah, and Rachel each only had two sons. However, that is not the purpose of childbirth. And in the end, Jacob still loved Rachel more. So although Leah hoped that Jacob would love her for her fertility, God didn't open Leah's womb so that she could be loved by Jacob. God opened her womb because he loved her. God had promised Jacob many descendants, but he hadn't made any promises to Leah. Yet he blessed Leah with seven children because he loved her and had comp compassion on her when she was unloved by her husband. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of hate in the world, and many people experience hatred on a daily basis. Now, a few weeks ago, I encouraged us all to let go of hate, and I hope that we've all done that, that we aren't harboring any hate or grudges within us. But what if you're on the receiving end of hate, uh, like Leah in today's passage? I wish I could tell you that as a follower of Jesus, you are exempt from uh, being hated, but the opposite is true. Let's look at John 15, verses 18 through 20. It says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So if you are following Jesus, the world will hate you. Now, it doesn't mean that everything that happens in life is a result of that truth. It doesn't mean that every time someone is mean to you that it's because they're of the world and you're following Jesus. It just means that we can expect some adversity in life because of our decision to follow Jesus. 
And I wish I could tell you that as a follower of Jesus, you would never experience punishment or consequences for your actions, but you will. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. And then Proverbs 13, 24, He who spares, <coughs> spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. So sometimes we get a spanking from God, and yes, we deserve it. And that doesn't mean that every time we're not feeling loved or something bad is happening that it's punishment, but sometimes it is. There are a lot of things that happen in our lives that we just don't have the answers to. We don't know why they happen. It's not because it's the world hating us for being a Christian. It's not because we're being punished for some reason for the lie that we told last week. It just seems like that there are times in the world where you just feel alone, where you feel like there, no one loves you. And if you ever find yourself in that situation, remember that you are loved. The creator of the universe loves you. There's a reason why John 3.16 is one of the most popular verses in the Bible. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. So when it says, For God so loved the world, the world includes you and me. The word translated world is cosmos. It's the same word used in John 15 to describe those who hate Jesus and will hate us. So God loved those who hate him, and he sent his son to die for those same people, for those who hate him and who hate us. This is backed up in Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. So let's look at that. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, he shall be, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then going back to John 15, verses 13 and 14, it says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So there is no one that has greater love for us than God. So why don't we always feel loved? The first problem is with the word feel. Remember at the beginning how I said that Satan wants us to associate love with a feeling. He does this because feelings come and go. You know, sometimes we feel good, we feel happy, we feel joyful. Other times we feel sad, depressed, angry. Those feelings change, but God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So his love doesn't change either. His love for us stays the same. So God loves us whether we feel it or not. The second problem is that we look to the world for love and affirmation instead of looking to God. People will always disappoint us, but God never will. Now, I do my best to consistently demonstrate love to Grace and the kids. Like I said, there are times that I mess up. There are times when they don't feel loved by me. So if they were dependent on me as their only source for feeling loved, they're going to be disappointed at times. Now, it's wonderful when we have friends and family that love us, and it's wonderful to experience that love and feel that love, but we can't depend on our family and friends to be our only source of love because at some point, they're bound to disappoint us. People will always disappoint you, but God never will. 
The third problem is believing the lies that Satan is feeding you. If you believe that no one loves you or cares about you, that's a lie. If you believe that you have to earn love, that is also a lie. If you believe that you don't deserve to be loved, that is a lie in the form of guilt. There's a difference between conviction from the Holy Spirit and guilt. Conviction from the Holy Spirit will lead to repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. Guilt will cripple you and leave you wallowing in despair. But one of the best ways to experience God's love is to spend time with him. And you've probably seen this in your human relationships, your relationships with your spouses or with your friends, that in order to have a strong relationship with them, you need to actually spend time with them. Um, our second oldest son is uh, a Marine. He's stationed in North Carolina right now, but the woman, the young lady that he would like to be with is still in Florida. And uh, you know, they're pretty early on in their relationship. And so when he went to California for training for over a month and he didn't have access to his cell phone, he couldn't contact her every day, he found that their relationship was weakened. And so the next time they were together, they had to rebuild that relationship because just that time apart, you know, not talking to each other every day weakened their relationship. And I'm sure you've experienced that in, in your own life. You know, friends that maybe you were best friends with in high school, you might drift apart you know, if you spend years away from them. There are those rare friendships where no matter how long you've been apart, you can just get back together and pick up where you left off. But often you need to spend time with a person to build a relationship with them. So the same is true with our relationship with God. We need to actually spend time with God in order to have a strong relationship with him. We can't expect to feel loved by God if we're not spending time with him. So one of the ways that we can spend time with God is in prayer. That's the communication that I talked about earlier. You know, how Grace and I do better when we openly and honestly communicate with each other. And the same is true with your relationship with God. The more you communicate with him, the more you pour out your heart to him, and then actually give him time to respond, the stronger your relationship will be. Now, most of us are pretty good about complaining to God or rattling off our list of concerns to him. But what we need to improve on is the just being still and allowing him to answer us, to speak to us. Give him a chance to say something. That communication with God should be a two-way street, not just you rattling off things to him, but actually spending time to listen. And that ties in with the second way that we can spend ta time with him is by spending time in his word. So that's one of the main ways he communicates with us is through his word. Now in today's society, we all have access to his word. We all have access to a copy of his word, so every day we can open it, we can spend time in it. And it's important to not just read it silently to yourself, but to read it out loud. There's power in the spoken word, and there's definitely power in God's spoken word. So read it out loud, and listen to what you're saying as you read it. Uh, take it to heart. Another way that we can spend time with him is spend time praising him. You know, there's different ways that you can praise him. You can praise him in song. You can praise him in dance. You can uh, just praise him with the words that you say. But spend time praising him. He inhabits the praises of his people, and he deserves our praise. He's worthy of our praise. So spend time giving him the praise and honor that he's due. And one of the places you can do that is in a building like this at a church. So the other way that we can spend time with him is to spend time with people who love him. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, he'll be there. So you know, as long as Grace Ewald and I are here, there's two or three people. There may not be many more than that some Sabbaths, but 
<clears throat> there, are, there will always be people here uh, praising God, worshiping him. And when we can surround ourselves with people that will love us and encourage us, we'll not only feel the love and encouragement from fellow believers, but we'll feel the love and encouragement from God. So it's important that we spend time with fellow believers, with people that love him whenever we can. So I know that it's easy to stand up here and to you know, tell you to do these things. I know that it's easy to say the words, you are loved, but I know that we all want to actually feel that love. And I know that sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where we're isolated by distance. You know, we don't have transportation to bring us to uh, fellowship with other believers. Uh, we may not have uh, access to a phone to call someone or we try calling and can't get a hold of them. And so there are times when we may feel lonely and isolated. But just remember that you're not alone. Don't buy into the lies that Satan is trying to tell you. Don't believe Satan when he tells you that love is only a feeling. You know, love is expressed in many ways. It can be through our words, but often it's through our actions. It's through uh, the things that we do for other people, the way that we treat people. And you never know when uh, the way that you're treating someone is expressing God's love to that person. You know, we have a food pantry here every week and uh, people come through the line and get food and you know, we want them to experience God in some way and sometimes it's just the, the kindness of providing them with food that that's how they experience God's love. They don't go to a church, they don't read their Bible and they may even avoid people who talk about Jesus. But when you're demonstrating that love to them, they can't help but experience God's love. So my encouragement for you is to never forget that you are loved. No matter what circumstance you find yourself in, you are loved. Let's pray. Now, Father, thank you for giving us your word to study. Uh, thank you for the many examples that we find in your word of of how you love us. And thank you for loving us even when we are unlovable. Now, Father, I pray that you will forgive us for our sins, that we will repent of the mistakes that we've made, and that we will turn our hearts and minds back to you. Now, Father, if there's any barrier, anything that's keeping us from experiencing your love, Father, I pray that you will remove it today so that we can uh, not just know intellectually that you love us, but we will actually feel that love and experience your presence in our lives. And Father, I pray that you will help us to share that love with others. Uh, help us to be a blessing to everyone that we meet. In Jesus' name, amen.